The Gospel of John, we continue our study this morning. We are in chapter one, beginning in verse 19. The first 18 verses in which we've spent three weeks is is known uh, by those who sort of uh, have written about the Gospel of John as the prologue. And John, John establishes sort of on a cosmic scale much of the great truth about, about Jesus as the eternal word of God, as the incarnate son of God, the, the framework is laid in those first 18 verses for things that we're gonna, John is gonna assume we know going forward what he said in those first few verses. Now, he, he brings his narrative down to a more human scale as we actually now step into a human scale narrative regarding Jesus. And the, the central figure that sort of steps forward for this next little section is, is John the Baptist. Now, Kerry taught us, and he's right, that the Gospel of John never calls him John the Baptist, but portrays him more consistently as John the Witness. So if I use those two terms interchangeably, you have to forgive me, especially you, Kerry. I've called him John the Baptist all my life, man, and you have messed me up. (laughs) But I love you, and I don't resent it even a little. (laughs) All right, I'm so glad to be a part of this team. God has been so good to me. All right, Uh, it's a lengthy passage, and rather than read the whole passage in one sweep, I'm gonna kind of make my way through it, but here's the deal. We see in the verse range from 19 to 37, we see three days, three consecutive days. There's, there's the first day and then you'll, the day where the narrative opens and you'll see in verse 29, the next day, and then again in verse 35, the next day. So taking those three days as our three sections, I want us to look at, at the Gospel of John and John the witness as one who lived for Jesus. John the Baptist had devoted his life to preparing the people, I say this in an introductory paragraph that's, that's in your notes, to receive the gospel that was coming in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Here, over the course of these three days, we see a great example of a life lived for Jesus. Roman numeral one, day one, John's fame for Jesus. As we join the story in the Gospel of John, chapter one, John the the Baptist has already been active for some time in ministry. He's drawing large crowds. Some have already begun to to entertain the notion that any time now he's gonna step forward and claim to be the Messiah. There were a lot of people with far less fame who had. There were others who were postulating all kinds of things about him. We'll touch upon some of those things that we'll see in the text. But he was quite a famous guy. John had come to be, in the minds of some, a bit of a big deal. He had already had one, at least, very pointed interaction with the Jerusalem leadership. You can read about it in Matthew chapter three. In fact, by the time we join the narrative here in John one, he has baptized Jesus some weeks before this. All three of the other gospels tell the story of the baptism of Jesus. John is gonna recall it briefly in a few verses, but that already happened in John's narrative because by John's narrative, the gospel of John, um, Jesus has returned from the wilderness and we know from all three of the other gospels, he spent 40 days in the wilderness after he was baptized. It's where he encountered those three very in your face temptations from Jesus. I mean, from Satan. And those temptations, those events are in the past now. But the ministry of John the Baptist continues. And we join on what I'll call day one because of our three days, it is day one. John is gonna divert his fame to Jesus. His fame is for Jesus. We see it in verses 19 through 28. And this is the testimony of John when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Roman numeral one in your notes, the delegation. The delegation. Again, John has had interaction with the Jerusalem leadership before, but this time they decide to make a formal thing of it. 
And they officially send a group of their own to go quite a day's journey, a, a long, maybe several days journey, down out of the city of Jerusalem, all the way east to the Jordan River, to the place where John was baptized, where his crowds in the wilderness were gathered. And they uh, have some questions for him, which leads to our letter B, the denials. The denials. Now it's interesting because this is verses uh, 20 and 21. John begins, or the, the, the gospel of John states that John the Baptist confessed and did not deny. And yet I've called this his denials. Because we're going to see in a moment, he makes some pretty pointed denials. What does it mean he did not deny? He confessed and did not deny. Well, it means he did not deny them the opportunity to hear his confession. He did not tuck his tail and run from the questions they were asking. He was there with a, with a confession. Who he was and why he was there, that confession leads with a series of denials. Because false messiahs were fairly common in Israel, because it was not unusual at all for somebody, especially somebody who could draw a crowd with a religiously themed message to end up claiming to be himself the Messiah, John the Baptist begins with, I am not the Christ. I'm not. I'm not gonna tell you that I'm the Savior. I'm not the Savior. I'm not gonna tell you that I'm the one who's gonna deal with your sin debt. I'm not. I'm not gonna tell you that I'm the one that even politically is gonna deal with the Roman Empire. I'm not. I'm not the Christ, I am not the Messiah. So they ask him, what then? Are you Elijah? That's based in a prophecy, it's in Malachi chapter four, verse five, that, that before the day of the Lord, which we know to be an end of the age event, that a reincarnated Elijah will come and bear witness to the gospel. Well, Jesus is going to say, that John the Baptist is one who comes in the spirit of Elijah. Luke 1, 17. Uh, his parents were told he would be the spirit in the, in the spirit of Elijah. But that's not what they're asking. They're asking, are you Elijah returned to earth? And he said, no, I'm not. Are you the prophet? Probably a reference to Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 through 18, where, where Moses said, one day expect a prophet that's a bigger deal than I am. To tell a bunch of Jews to expect somebody who's a bigger deal than Moses is a big deal. Of course, that verse in Deuteronomy, those verses in Deuteronomy are actually referring to Jesus again. So John says, no, I'm not him either. Before John the Baptist could get on with his message to them, he had to carve off some things that he's not. You and I increasingly are going to feel the burden to do that as well. As our culture goes further and further in revealing just how anti-God it is. Notice I didn't say as our culture becomes more and more anti-God because there's never been a culture on the face of the earth since the Garden of Eden that is a culture that is pro-God. That has never happened. There have been more or less expressions of animosity and as our culture gets more and more candid in expressing its animosity toward God, you and I are going to have to get more and more clear about what we are and what we aren't. Oh, I know who Christians are. You're the ones who are so bigoted. No, we're not bigoted. Oh, I know who you are. You're the ones who are this or that phobic. No, we're clear on what the word of God says is sin. In order that men and women would repent of that sin and be saved... We're not terribly phobic. It's going to become important for us to deal with who we aren't so that we can be clear about whose we are. Which leads us to Roman numeral 
see the demand. Okay, okay. You've told us who you aren't. You've carved away some bad ideas, but here's the deal. So they said to him, verse 22, who are you? We need to give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? Ooh, I love that question because that question is such a, a good warning sign. Let me tell you what you ought to say about yourself. Not much. You don't matter much. You are not that big a deal. I am not that big a deal. Altogether, we are not that big a deal. John had an opportunity. John, ooh, John had a resume. John lived weird. John preached strong. John dressed funny, ate funny, drew huge crowds. John could tell a fascinating story about John, and that's what they asked him to do. Tell us what you have to say about yourself. John, John handled it well because he turned it to Jesus. You don't care about me. You ought not care about me. And here in April of 2021, I pray to God, you don't care about me. I promise you, I'm not that terribly interesting. But I can tell you about Jesus. How you respond to me, a billion years from now, neither you nor I will remember how you responded to me. But it's gonna matter a whole lot how you respond to Jesus. And so, John makes the declaration, letter D, verses 23 through 28. First, we, me, not much, not much. What do I say about myself? I say I'm not much. Verse 23, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. I'm just a voice. I'm just a voice in the wilderness, but what I have to say, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now, I gotta tell you, humility is one of those hard things because the moment you get good at it, you're proud of your humility and you just screwed yourself up. But I have to tell you this, if my life were a specific, pointed, absolute fulfillment of a prophecy in Isaiah, if the prophet Isaiah had a paragraph about Russell, you better believe you'd know it. I'd have the t-shirts made, it'd be on the sign out front, Russell, whom Isaiah talked about. <laughs> you know? John doesn't even mention Isaiah. John, the author of the gospel, tells us this is from Isaiah. John says, me, you wanna know who I am? I'm, I'm out here in the desert saying get ready for Jesus. I'm just a voice in the wilderness. I'm a small thing. His declaration, I'm not a big deal. But there is among you standing one you do not know. I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. So they, they had been sent from the Pharisees. Verse 25, they ask him, then why are you baptizing if you're not the Christ or Elijah or the prophet? And John answered them, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. There is one you do not know. My life, my message, my intent, my passion, my everything is to bring to you the word of the one you do not know in your workplace. There are some who do not know. In your neighborhood, there stands one they do not know. In your family, for some of you, there is one they do not know. And while me and you are not a big deal, he is there stands one they do not know and they need to know we're not much but among you is one who's a unknown to you and he is everything 
Even he, verse 27, who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Not worthy. I, uh, I worked on the thing of worthy and not worthy last week, but let me, let me, let me just share again. If you're here this morning and you think you have salvation because you were worthy of it, you don't understand your own salvation if indeed you have it. If you're here this morning and you're outside of Christ and your concern would be, I don't know that he would save me because I perceive I am not worthy of the love of the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, creator of the entire universe. I don't think I'm worthy of that. Though I have bad news and good news. I think a couple of weeks ago when Pastor Mark was preaching, I think we decided we mostly like to hear the bad news first and get it over with, so I'll lead with the bad news. You're not worthy. You can settle in and get perfectly comfortable with the idea that you are not worthy of the love of the omnipotent God. He is absolutely just. He is absolutely holy. You are born a citizen of a world at war with him and you are in that war on the wrong side from the time you draw breath in before. You are not worthy of his love. That's the bad news. And it's true. The good news. He saves the unworthy. In fact, everyone he's ever saved has been saved in their unworthiness. If you will turn from your sin and trust him by faith, he'll make you his child. Not because of your worthiness, but because of his phenomenal grace. John says, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes. In Luke 7, Jesus calls John... Well, he says of him, there's never been a man born of woman like John the Baptist. Paraphrase, John the Baptist, the greatest man that ever lived. John the Baptist says, I'm not worthy to untie his shoe straps, let alone receive his salvation, but he loves me anyway. He, I'm not much, but he is everything. And so whatever fame John had, he said, look, It's not my message, it's not me. My message is Jesus. My life is not me, my life is Jesus. The whole thing is Jesus. Which leads us to Roman 2, his focus on Jesus. Verses 29 through 34. The next day, this is day two of our sequence of three days. The next day, he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That speaks, letter A on your outline, to Jesus' sacrifice. Oceans of blood had been spilt down the centuries in Jerusalem by by temporary stopgap lambs. Temporary sacrifices that that were the teaching tool toward the one day ultimate sacrifice that would be the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. As far back as Genesis 22, when Abraham took Isaac, his son, to the top of Mount Moriah, and there uh, was prepared to make a sacrifice and An angel of the Lord stayed his hand and said, you don't need to do that. And and in the course of that conversation, his son asked him, where's the sacrificial lamb? And Abraham said a statement more radically prophetic than perhaps he even knew, God will provide a lamb. And here, John the witness says, there's the lamb that God has provided. Other lambs in the temple could stay the hand of God's wrath, but this, Jesus, is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Now that does not mean that he takes away all sin penalty from all people forever because God is just and there are most of humanity dies unforgiven. There are those who've tried to make this verse lean into the idea of universalism. Well, you have to look at how John uses world. He uses it 61 times in just his gospel. Uses it frequently outside his gospel in 1st, 2nd, 3rd John and Revelation. John's use of world doesn't speak to universal depth. It speaks to scope. 
John 3, 16 is a great example. God so loved the world that he gave his son, whom we know takes away the sin of the world. Okay? God so loved the world that he gave his son from this verse, who takes away the sin of the world. He gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. The use of world here means all people or people of all sorts all over the world, all kinds of people. For you and me, it means people like us and people not like us. People from all kinds of ethnic backgrounds, all kinds of economic backgrounds, all kinds of religious backgrounds, all kinds of life stories, if they will turn from their sin and follow Jesus Christ by faith, there is no restriction anywhere on the world, in the world on who can do that if they will repent, if they will come to faith in Christ. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world speaks to his sacrifice. And by the way, if you're here this morning and you're outside of Christ, the nightmare scenario is you would face God with your sins not taken away. Because if you have not believed, you've not trusted Jesus by faith, your sin debt is still your own. On the cross, however, we see the justice of God and the justification provided by God, the justice that Christ's death was necessary, the justification provided for all who will turn from their sin and believe. Jesus' sacrifice, letter B, Jesus' sonship, verse 30. Um, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. John the witness here says, look, Jesus ranks ahead of me. Jesus was before I was. Now we already know from the preamble, from the prologue, that he has been from the beginning. Here what John is saying to his followers is, well now wait a minute. Anybody who knew anything about the biographies of Jesus and John, John was actually older. Remember Mary, Jesus' mom, and Elizabeth, John's mom were, were probably cousins. They were related. And Mary got pregnant six months after Elizabeth did. So assuming the gestations were normal and similar, John the Baptist is six months older than Jesus. And yet here he says he's a bigger deal than me because he was before I was. John, explain what you mean. Well, I I was born first, but I came into existence at the time I was conceived in my mom's womb. He came into existence, oh wait, no he didn't. He never did. You cannot come into existence if you have already existed from eternity past. He was before I am. He's affirming the deity and sonship of Christ by that statement, his salvation, his, son, his sacrifice, his sonship, and let her see his salvation. Verses 31 through 34 are John the Baptist's personal salvation testimony, and I'm gonna quickly walk you through it, but I want you to see it's a pretty good outline for a personal testimony, one you ought to take a look at. By the way, you should be able to tell your salvation story if you know Jesus anywhere, anytime with no warning. You should be able to give a reason for the hope that is within you. It should be salted and peppered with scripture. But there, there, I, 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 I can't tell. If I ask you to tell the story of your car ownership, most of you wouldn't need any prep. You could start with the first beater you ever bought in high school and go right up to today and not miss a beat. You can tell your car. If I ask you to tell me the story of the zip codes you've lived in. You'd say, oh, I got that, I lived here, and then I grew, up here. I grew up here, and then I moved there, and then I went there for college, then I went there, and then I went there. If I ask you to tell the story of how Jesus Christ saved you, some of y'all would go ostrich, head in the sand, hoping I don't ask again. The most important part of your biography should come out of you pretty easily. 
three major sections. Number one, there was a time when I didn't know Jesus. Listen to John's witness, beginning in verse 31. I myself did not know him. He says it again in verse 33. I myself did not know him. There was a time when I didn't know Jesus. I hear a lot of testimonies, and one of the things that frightens me most, or at least causes me to really want to tap the brakes, when someone starts their story and they say, well, you know, I, 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 I've always been a Christian. <laughs> no, no, you haven't. No, you haven't. No, you have not. You may have had a mom and daddy who loved Jesus. If you did, I'm glad. I, I did and do. You may have been brought up in, in settings where the word of God was kept before you as a kiddo. I was too, and I'm glad. But there's not, since, since Adam and Eve started having offspring, there's nobody who's always been a Christian. And you should be able to tell the story of a time in your life when you were far from God because there was such a time. Now, you may have been saved older, you may have been saved younger. Point one in your testimony is, I was a sinner far from God outside of his love. Point two, Jesus in his grace revealed himself to me. Now, the circumstances will be different for all of us. Nobody's going to have circumstances like John the Baptist had. I didn't know him, but for this purpose, verse 31, I came baptizing with water that he might be revealed to Israel. And John bore witness of an event from weeks before. I saw the Spirit descend from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. I myself did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, he on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. That is, God in his grace revealed to me who Jesus is. And I came to faith in Christ, turning from my sin and trusting him by faith. And you should tell the story often of how that happened to you. I didn't know Jesus, but there came a day when by his grace he revealed himself to me. And now I've come to be a follower of his and my life bears witness to that. John says it like this. And I have seen, verse 34, and I have seen and borne witness that this is the Son of God, which leads me to Roman 3. Three days living for Jesus, his fame, focus it all on Jesus. His focus of his life, it's all about Jesus. And finally, day three, his followers pointed to Jesus. Uh, letter A, B, C. Letter A, John's friends, verse 35. The next day, again, we go to day three now. The next day, Jesus was standing with two of his disciples. Now, later in this paragraph, beyond this morning, but later in this paragraph, we're going to hear that one of them was Andrew. And our best guess is the other one was John, because John, the author, never names himself, and this second early disciple is not named. So it would be very like John the Apostle to not name himself. So for our purposes, we'll say Andrew and John. The next day, John was standing with two of his disciples, his friends. John understood that his friends, his circle of influence, the human beings that God had brought into close proximity in his life, they were his mission field. They were who he was supposed to tell about Jesus. See, if you're a follower of Christ, you have been given the role of ambassador. An ambassador is someone who comes from a foreign ruler to share a message from that ruler in the place where he's been assigned. Your friends are not an accident. The circle of people you can strike a conversation up with at work, at school, in your family, that circle of people into which God has placed you that's not an accident. It is your ambassadorial assignment. John saw it. We see it because not only do we see his friends in Andrew and John, we see second, his faithfulness. And he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, behold the Lamb of God. 
John pointed his friends toward Jesus. Now look, that's a relationship risk, isn't it? Because the moment you bring eternal, look, you got, you got people in your life right now, you can talk weather, you can talk sports scores, you can even talk politics, and it's reasonably comfortable. You bring the Lamb of God into the conversation. Their need for that sacrifice, the availability of that sacrifice, if they will turn from their sin and follow Jesus, it changes things. And I gotta tell you, here's what I've heard down the long years. I heard it again recently. Well, I would, I would bring it up, but I don't wanna push them away. Oh, be careful with that. They are away. They're as away as they're gonna get and they're in danger of being eternally away. You telling them about Jesus is not gonna push them. You know, what, you, you know what you're afraid of pushing them away from? Are you honest enough to look at it? You tell me, what are you afraid of pushing them away from? Yourself. That's exactly right. We get in a comfortable relationship rhythm. It's easy going. It's nice. And they die and go to hell unwarned. You can't save them. I get that. You and I are not in the salvation business, but we are in the warning business. We're in the message delivery business. And it is a tragedy that friends of mine are going to die and go to hell. But it's on me if friends of mine die and go to hell unwarned. That's on me. Likewise, it's on you. John pointed his friends to Jesus. We have his friends, we have his faithfulness, and then, praise God, we get a glimpse at his fruitfulness. Verse 37, those two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Is everybody you share the gospel with gonna come to faith in Christ? If you share it enough, probably not. Probably not. Will some come to Christ if you share your faith enough? Probably so. Probably so. Why don't you try it and find out? John pointed his friends to Jesus and they became followers of Christ. What a beautiful, simple little three verse picture. And across this whole passage, what a marvelous three day picture of a life lived for Jesus. Jesus.